For now, we are still doing wrap-ups and TBRs, and this time we're on time, as opposed to last month's, which I feel like I just did the wrap-up and TBR uh, two weeks ago. Uh, in this video, we have seven traditional books, three graphic novels, which means that this last month I read 10 books in total. Let's get to the wrap-up. First up is Jade City by Fonda Lee. This is an Asian inspired fantasy. It is the start of the Greenbone Saga series. And uh, it is, it's light on fantasy, heavy on politics. Let me tell you a little bit about it. The story focuses on one family, the Call family, and we've got various point of views throughout the novel, primarily from that particular family. And they lead the No Peak clan, who are currently at peace with another major clan within the region, uh, but in the in the you know length of the story uh, throughout the duration of the story we go from peacetime to wartime and it's following these various family members who are leading the various branches of this clan uh, as the as the tensions rise I did a whole review on this channel already you can click the link in the annotation to see a little bit more about my feelings about this book generally speaking I thought it was extremely well written a very good story with some complex characters and some cool drama but there are a lot of politics and it's just too much politics for me it's not what I'm looking for in a gripping fantasy novel and so while I thought it was really expertly done in many ways it just didn't work for me so while a lot of people like it and it's even received many awards which it's probably merited I only gave it three out of five stars Next up is James and the Giant Peach by Roald Dahl. I did, I, I've been doing some Roald Dahl books. I did The Witches uh, earlier and did a review. You can click on the link in the annotations with my friend Frank. And then he's coming in for Halloween this year. And so we thought, hey, what's another quick book that we could read? Let's just stick with Roald Dahl. We did James and the Giant Peach. You, like me, may have read this book when you were a kid, and it was good when you were a kid. It was fun, but it is very short. It's still whimsical, cute, all of those things. But there's really not much to it. Really short story, less than 150 pages. James drops some magical crystals. It, it gets on a peach. The peach continues to grow. James opens up the door and goes inside the peach, meets some other fantastical creatures that are now, uh, like, uh, they, they speak and they talk and they have personalities. Like, you've got the dainty ladybug, you've got the old green grasshopper, you've got the silkworm, and, and all of the rest of the cast and characters there. And the journey from the little peach orchard there uh, to the skyscrapers through the sky and the water all of those things still intact still a lot of fun and, and there's still probably like I didn't even know this when I read it as a kid but there's probably a deeper story going on that talks about escapism and finding light and hope and friends and in writing even uh, so all of that's great I didn't love it I don't think it's the best rolled doll bug I don't even think it's necessarily in his top three Maybe not even in his top five. This is another three stars for me. And then I hopped on a relatively new book. I mean, really brand new. It came out September 29th of this year, 2020. It is called A Deadly Education by Na Naomi Novik. And this is a book that I wanted to be better than what it actually was. The premise sounds exceptional. It's a darker Hogwarts that's bent on killing its students. It's a magically gifted girl that's set on unlocking the mysteries of her school. And she's having to enlist the help of her fellow classmates of whom she doesn't know whether or not she can trust them. All of that sounds so good, yet sadly, it's so not. From the first page to the last... Mrs. Novick is giving us exposition and exposition and exposition and info dumps and explaining to us so many intricacies of this, of this school and of this magic system that it just becomes so tedious and so monotonous and so boring and so humdrum that we can't even get into any of the story because still halfway through the book, we're having things explained to us. I saw another reviewer say this, quote, Novik seems so in love with the world she created that she neglected to actually do anything with it. And I agree wholeheartedly. Unfortunately, I just couldn't connect with this story or its characters, even though I wanted to. So I gave it two stars out of five, not off to a good month. 
And then what turned it all around was The Invisible Life of Adia LaRue by V.E. Schwab. This one was actually my first V.E. Schwab book. I didn't read either of her other major series uh, yet. Now that I have read this standalone novel, I, I'm kind of interested in A Darker Shade of Magic and even the Villains series. Although I've heard things that are making me uh, a little bit nervous to step into that. But this book is set in 1714 France and a young Adeline LaRue is about to be married to a man that she doesn't want to have anything to do with. And so in a desperate plea for independence, she makes a prayer and a God who only answers in the dark responds. Adeline is granted her independence for many lifetimes. However, the catch is everyone that she comes into contact with will forget her completely the moment they turn away from her. And from this moment forward, that is the case. We kind of jump back and forth between the 1700s and present day, modern day New York City as we find out Adeline's backstory and how she dealt with and began to understand her curse up until the modern time where on a seemingly random occasion, someone remembers her name. It's a great premise that I haven't seen done before and it works exceptionally well. We've got a really, really small cast of characters. Adeline LaRue, Addy is what she goes by. Um, she is very intriguing, very multidimensional, very real. There's a small other cast of characters that I never really felt attached to. And then a weird thing is about a quarter of the way through, we get a new point of view character and I never connected with him that much either. Although I know why Schwab was, was introducing him at that point and how his story kind of off set with Addie's and how they connected that is the tale that is being told but because of this format uh, it, it becomes a little bit uh, monotonous again uh, about halfway through and I know that a lot of people found it oh man it's way too repetitious at this point I'm gonna set it down don't listen to me don't if you press through it's well worth it because this conclusion is absolutely satisfying it's a great story and I did a full review on it you can click on the annotation uh, to to watch that uh, I, I gave this Four out of five stars. And then I did a graphic novel. It's called The Mystery Night, and it was adapted by Ben Avery, but it's from the story of George R. R. Martin. These are, if you've been listening on this channel or watching, you know that I've done the other two graphic novels in this series so far. It's a prequel to A Song of Ice and Fire or Game of Thrones, and they're short stories, novellas, I believe, that are then adapted into graphic novels. I've thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed the first two and unfortunately man this third one and it's the most recent release so far there's going to be more but it's the last one that's currently been released it was disappointing and do you know why it was disappointing because it was so politically heavy politically charged and i don't love it i've already acknowledged that in this video uh here you still continue with dunk and egg the two characters that i love and they find themselves uh, going to this competition in this kind of walled city castle-like area uh and they meet a new cast of characters and again so politically charged i didn't even know really what was going on the majority of the time there's a lot of names being thrown around and me nothing knowing nothing of the universe here it kind of just flew all over my head and so while it was still pretty to look at and there were still some really cool moments i didn't get the underlying drama just because i'm not as connected as as maybe other people coming to this graphic novel series are so well, I didn't think it was absolute garbage by any means. It just didn't live up to the standards of the first two, which I thought were very well done. Uh, this, I ended up giving three out of five stars. Up next, I'm continuing through my reread of the Ember series in preparation for the final book, A Sky Beyond the Storm, uh, that comes out in December by Saba Tahir that concludes the series. This book, A Torch Against the Night, is, is great. It's not as good as the first. I still think it's slower paced. It's a travel book. So really, at the beginning of the novel, we're leaving one location, setting out to get to another location, and... We only get there within the last like 100 pages of the of the story. And so it is a travel novel, but there are purposeful things happening throughout. We've got three POVs instead of two this time. We've got uh, Laia, Elias, and Helene, which 
I love Helene. I did another review, kind of like just spaz out about this novel. You can click on that in the annotations if you want to watch the full thing, but it really is just a continuation from the previous story, so I can't go too much into it without spoilers, but uh, Elias and Laya are traveling together. Uh, uh, Elias is sick. He's not doing well, and it, Laya is trying to rescue him and save him while Helene is dealing with her own struggles, trying to... Um, work for and with the emperor while keep her family protected while seeking out Elias because that's her task and all of the drama there. One of the things I love about this series and this book in particular is that the characters, there's no one that's just like utter good or utter bad. They are flawed and they make good decisions. Bad characters make good decisions and do good things. And then good characters make bad decisions and do bad things. And that's reality and that's real life. And that's why I like these characters and this story. I cannot wait for the epic conclusion. I know it's going to be incredible. This book, I'm not touching really the ranking as I continue to go through uh, this series. And so I left it at a solid five stars. Again, not as good as the first. I would give that one six out of five stars, which can't do. Uh, but this one's still solid five out of five. Then I did another graphic novel. I got an ARC advanced reader copy of Batman, 100 Greatest Moments, The Highlights from the History of the Dark Knight by Robert Greenberger. And while that sounds really, really cool, it really, really wasn't. Again, this is another one where the premise is actually kind of cool. Uh, we follow various stories, arcs of uh, our, our caped crusader from kind of his earliest appearances in the 1940s comics to some more modern day arcs. All of this is comics, so we're not dealing with the movies, although uh, some of those are referenced, but uh, we're dealing with some of his key moments. Some of them you'll know, some of them you'll have no idea they ever existed. Some of them it's going to be like his first encounter with the Joker or with Poison Ivy. Some of them it's going to be like how Robin showed up multiple times and the different Robins and their stories as well as like Alfred and how he was connected. It's going to be some of those key moments, but really it's just a few paragraphs summarizing in a relatively boring fashion those moments. And then we get a few clips from the comics that they were in, but not even the full stories. It was, it's odd. And I didn't love it. If for, for a huge, huge, huge Batman fanatic, maybe you want this for your coffee table or collection. But if you just like superheroes in general, or especially if you don't like superheroes, this book's definitely not for you. I only gave it 2.5 stars. Now, these last three, I have not yet finished, but at the time of this record, I'm recording this early so that I can get this out to you by the end of the month or at the start of November, because I don't want it to be late this time. So I'm recording a little prematurely, but I'm hoping to finish these three books either today or tomorrow. So within the next couple of days before October ends, this one is Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. And the premise already excited me because it's inspired inspired by the civilizations that existed in pre-Columbian America. I don't know many other, actually, I don't know any other, I'm sure there are some, but I don't know any other books that are inspired by that same kind of civilization or culture. Currently, I'm about 75% of the way through, and I'm really enjoying it. There are, I think, four POVs so far, and, um, and it's hard to put into words what this is about. Uh, we've got this, this young man that has been blinded from childhood and there's something magical, mystical about him. Um, at, at, at the beginning of each chapter, we get how many days until convergence, which means how many days until uh, the sun and the moon pass over. What is that called again? Black sun? What? Solar eclipse. That's what it is. And uh, he's being transported on a ship that is, uh, and he's one of the POVs, that is being commanded by uh, one of our other POVs, Shiala, who there's something mystical and magical and powerful about her that she can use her voice to sing and calm the waves as they travel and get the ship to its location, Tova, uh, the destination city, in a certain amount of time. In Tova, that city that they're going to, we've got another POV who is uh, a priestess. She is uh, one of the leaders of the of, of one of the tribes there. And then our final POV is from a, another young man who just lost his mother from another one of the tribes that kind of they bash heads there in Tova. And so all of these stories that are somewhat distinct, but that they're coming together. And the tale is so interesting so far. And I'm in love with the characters. I haven't rated it yet because I haven't finished it yet. But within the next couple of days, 
days, I should have a rating and I'll definitely do a full review of this. And if I remember, then there will be a, an annotation here shortly for that full review. The next book is Bloody Rose by Nicholas Eames. This is another book that I haven't yet finished, but I'll have it complete by the end of the day. This is the second book in the band saga, the first one being Kings of the Wild, which I did a full review on, and I've loved the series. Um, this book is quite different. We follow a different cast of characters, and it's similar to the first in that our main character isn't like the lead protagonist, really. Um, she is a side character in the first book, Kings of the Wild, the bass player of the band. Hopefully, you're able to follow me here. They're a group of mercenaries, by the way. They're not a rock band, but they're built very similarly to an old rock band. And so the bass player is kind of the one that's telling the story. Where, well, here in this story, the bard, if you know anything about traditional fantasy or even Dungeons and Dragons, the bard. Uh, the minstrel, the, the singer, the musician, the side character that tells stories is the one that is telling the story. And she's kind of our main character, but she's not the leader of the band. Uh, Bloody Rose is. And they are traveling around, going from city to city, fighting in these competitions, but then they get wrapped up in the drama that was left over from the previous book. I'm enjoying it, but I'll tell you this. I'm not enjoying it as much as Kings of the Wild yet. However... We'll have to see how it ends because if it ends epically, like if there are some key epic moments here at the end of the story, then it might sway me even more. That being said, I am really enjoying it so far and the artwork is so cool, but that is just indicative of the cool story that's being told. And then finally, we've got a graphic novel that I'll finish today as well called Harleen, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce the author's name. This is blowing me away. I'm not even kidding. It might end up being my favorite superhero graphic novel that I've ever read. If you can't tell by the cover alone, this actually focuses on Dr. Harleen Quinzel. Quinzel. I don't know if I'm pronouncing her last name correctly. Who becomes a villain that is associated with the Joker. And this is the story of her descent into madness. And it is beautifully illustrated it is, it is um, melodramatic at times and kind of like in your face, like, okay, you didn't have to do that. But it is, the story is told exceptionally, exceptionally well. We're seeing the story through her eyes as she's getting sleepless night after sleepless night. And after, as she's kind of like descending into the madness that is Gotham City and its underbelly as she's interviewing various villains and even Joker himself, who is a lot more beautiful in this graphic novel than I've seen in many uh, retellings of this story. But it is really cool to find out how this doctor, this therapist really becomes the Harley Quinn that so many of us know and love. All right, I did it. Those are the books that I have read and am finishing up for the month of October. Now, my TBR for November is right around the corner, and I'll just preface this by saying there are a lot less books on there, but very purposefully so. Before you leave, let me know in the comments down below if you've read any of these books and what your thoughts are on them, and if there are any books that I need to definitely put on my TBR for the coming months. Thank you so much, as always, for watching this video, for clicking like. If you haven't yet, click subscribe, join the Dragon Army, and we'll see you in the next video.